Welcome, everybody. I should say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you are joining us. My name is Teresa Diaz, and I'm the Unit Chief for Epidemiology and Monitoring and Evaluation in the Maternal Newborn Child Adolescent Health and Aging Department in the World Health Organization in Geneva, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I just want to do a little housekeeping. First of all, this is being translated into French and Spanish. So if you look at the globe icon at the bottom of your screen, you can press that to get the language that you prefer. The audio is shut off, but we encourage you to ask Q's and A's in the icon that you can see at the bottom. And throughout, we will try to address your questions, but keep in mind that we do have a question and answer session that will be coming up later on. So let's begin. I would first like to introduce Dr. Anshu Banerjee. He is the director of the Department of Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health and Aging in the World Health Organization here in Geneva. He was earlier the Director of Global Coordination in the Office of the Assistant Director General in Family, Women, and Children's Health in WHO. He was also the WHO Country Representative in Albania and Sudan, and he has over 20 years of experience in public health. So, Anshu, why don't you begin and bring us through the agenda and so forth? Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. And it's really a pleasure to be here uh, today because one of the recommendations that came out in 2019 out of the um, um, WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission report on a future for the children's for the children's world or for the world, yeah, for the children's world, was really uh, to propose the development of a user-friendly country dashboard to assess the effects of children's well-being and sustainable development. And it's really wonderful that today now we are here at this point to launch this dashboard. So uh, the agenda for today is really going to look at, uh, we're going to have opening remarks from our Director General, Dr. Tedros. Um, and after that, we'll have an introduction of the dashboard by Professor Anthony Costello, who is the Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at the University College at, uh, of London, and who is really behind also the development of uh, this WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission. Um, we will then have presentations on the dashboard by Jennifer Rakego um, and by Gerard Lopez, um, and uh, Teresa will introduce them further. We'll then have the second part, and that is about how to use the dashboard. And we'll have some reflections from Helga Fokstad, the executive director from PMNCH, as well as a panel discussion on the use of the dashboard by Tanya Doherty, who is the Chief Specialist Scientist um, at uh, the Health Systems Research Unit in South Africa. We have Dr. Kwame Saki, who is the Program Director for Children in All Policies in Ghana. And we have Dr. John Barazzo, who is the Lead Advisor for Child Health with the Department of Global Health at Save the Children US. And we'll talk about testing strategies with Srivatsan Raja Gopalan from CAP 2030. And finally, we'll have some Q and A's and a closing remarks by Dr. Vidya Ganesh, who is the director for the, Def for the Division of Data Analytics, Planning and Monitoring at UNICEF. So that's the agenda. And I'd like now to introduce once again, Dr. Tetros Gebreyesus, who is the director general for a couple of opening remarks. Dr. Tetros, over to you. Dear colleagues and friends, our children face an uncertain future. War, climate change, ecological degradation, displacement, violence, harmful marketing and growing inequalities are threatening the future of children's health and well-being everywhere. The report by WHO, UNICEF and the Lancet Commission on Child Health and Well-Being called for a renewed commitment to children's fundamental right to health and for a mechanism to hold countries accountable for delivering that right. Clear, 
easily accessible data is central to accountability. Today, we're launching a new dashboard that will bring together a broad range of metrics to track national progress in a range of areas for children's health and well-being. This dashboard will be available on the WHO, UNICEF, and CAP2030 websites, and in future on the websites of the WHO's and UNICEF's regional offices. This standard approach to visualization across UN agencies is new, but it's one I hope will expand upon in the future. This dashboard, combining the resources of multiple agencies, can be a powerful tool for member states in their work to accelerate progress in child health and well-being. We look forward to hearing your feedback so that it can be further refined to meet the needs of policy makers and other stakeholders. I thank you. Thank you, Anchu, and thank you, Dr. Tedros. I would now like to welcome Anthony Cazzello to say a few words to let us know how this all began. Dr. Anthony Costello is a pediatrician and professor of global health and sustainable development at the University College London. He is an expert in maternal, newborn, and child health, community interventions, and is currently is also the co-chair of the Lancet Countdown on Climate and Health and the chair of the um, Children in All Policies 2030. Anthony? Thank you very much, Theresa. It's really great to be here. And um, as uh, Dr. Tedros and Dr. Anshu have both said, uh, we launched this report back in February 2020. It was called the WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission on a future for our children question mark. And the question mark was important because the report and then subsequent commentaries that were published in the Lancet about, you know, the potential for the COVID-19 pandemic to reverse the gains made in children's health. And we're still awaiting a lot of that data. It, it, it stressed the huge threats that Dr. Tredros has laid out, climate change. We're going to transgress the 1.5 degree limit within the next decade. Um, the political instability, war, war in Europe, inequities perpetuating intergenerational cycles of poverty, and predatory commercial practices. And so, you know, the first point of call for the report was to have a renewed commitment to children's health and well-being, because it's laid out very clearly in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And many of those principles are not being fulfilled. Now, from a scientific standpoint, you might say, well, we know what to do. We, we've known for a long time what policies are required to make children, you know, healthy and well. But we wanted to understand why politically countries around the world uh, are failing to implement these policies. Is it economic? Is it political? And we asked two really eminent politicians uh, to join us. One was uh, as co-chairs, uh, Dr. Uh, well, he he the Right Honourable Helen Clark, who was the former Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand and Director of the UNDP, and also Dr. Awa Kolsek, who is a paediatrician, but also a Minister of State in Senegal. And we were thrilled that they joined us as chairs and they were incredibly wise and active in that report. And a key recommendation, we made many, but a key one was that actually policymakers have a limited attention span. They're very busy and they need to have a focus on data that's very accessible and easy to look at. And the only way we're gonna really fulfill children's rights, as Dr. Tedros has said, is through a process of accountability. And by that, we mean monitor, review, and then act, take action. And, and particularly to monitor performance across the four dimensions of the Children's Rights Convention. That's the right to be healthy, the right to be protected, uh, the right to be educated and the right to be fairly treated and heard. And that's where the dashboard comes in. It's a tool. You might say, well, there's lots of dashboards. But the really important thing about this is that policymakers 
do listen to WHO and UNICEF. They particularly listen to them because they are, uh, in a sense, owners of the organization. And they've also used approved uh, country data. So um, having something that's very easy for them to use was incredibly important. Now, after the report came out, we wanted to work to look at another key message, which is that we need children in all policies. Um, we set up, uh, our, when we got some funding a year later, children in all policies with most of the commissioners involved in this. Uh, and we've achieved a lot. I mean, we have a great executive director in Dr. Sarah Dalgleish. We have five working groups. We have nine countries already involved. And if you want to learn more, I'm not going to talk about it now. Check out our website, which is uh, cap-2030.org. That's children in all policies-2030.org. Now, to create the dashboard, we started by setting up a working group, uh, which was led by Teresa Diaz, who's your facilitator today. Uh, at, she's the, the boss at WHO and her team, who are great. And Dr. Jennifer Requejo from UNICEF uh, and her team, who is equally great. And it's, it's been a fantastic collaboration. And my own UCL colleagues, Dr. Lou Graham and Shivatsan uh, Raja Gopalan, uh, have helped out as well. Uh, Shrivat will be talking a bit later. And we took the input of scholars, experts at the World Bank, uh, at Save the Children Fund, the Lancet Countdown on Climate and Health, leading universities. Uh, we've been working on this meeting fortnightly for the past uh, year. We've had a top design firm work on the presentation and functionality. And I'm delighted that my colleagues at WHO UNICEF are gonna talk more about the decisions that were made about content and functionality. But I can't emphasize enough the importance of this for getting policymakers to really focus on how they're doing, where the weak areas are, and how to remedy that. And that's what we have, a new accountability mechanism for children's health and well-being, which I hope will lead to a speeding up of the process to provide children with a future that they really want. So I'm really thrilled with this whole work. I'm so looking forward to this presentation now. So I'll hand back to you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Now we get to like the meat of this. We're going to be explaining how the dashboard was developed and how it works. And I would like to introduce you to two people who will be walking us through this. First, there is Dr. Jennifer Recchio. She is currently a senior advisor in the Division of Data Analytics Planning and Monitoring at UNICEF headquarters in New York. Her specific role is to serve as the chief of the health and HIV unit, coordinating activities of immunization, HIV, and maternal newborn child and adolescent health team, and contributing to UNICEF's work on universal health coverage. Second is Gerard Lopez. Gerard has worked over 18 years as a data specialist for the World Health Organization, the US Centers for Disease Control, and multiple cooperative agreement partner organizations. His work has been focused on the design and implementation of public health digital information systems. Okay, I turn it over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, as Teresa has already mentioned, I will be describing how the dashboard was developed and Gerard will accompany me in this um, and he will give you, pro provide you more of a showcase of how that dashboard functions. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of what the dashboard looks like. It was developed um, by WHO, UNICEF and CAP 2030 in support of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. As Anthony has already noted, it provides a very simple tool for stakeholders to use to monitor and compare a core set of indicators on child health and well being by region, age group, and income. Next slide, please. As, as also we've already heard, the, the main purpose of this dashboard is to enable comparison of key data on child health and well being across countries. It is also a tool that can be used to highlight where progress is being made and where there are gaps that really need to be addressed. 
Also, most importantly, the whole intent of this dashboard is to promote the use of this evidence for action, both for decision making by policymakers um, and civil society advocates, and also for advocacy purposes. So this slide gives you a sense of the range of target audiences that can all use this dashboard for various reasons. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to give you a sense of the, of the production journey, um, the steps that were taken in order to develop this product. Next slide, please. So just to re-emphasize, this really was, as Anthony had noted, it took about a year to pull this all together. It was a multi-step consensus-based process that involved a lot of different actors. So the first initial part was an agreement that WHO and UNICEF would lead a consultative process to create this dashboard through a series of steps. The first step involved reaching agreement on what this dashboard would actually look like. So essentially the format, and then also trying to think through what were the main domain areas or topical issues that would be covered and presented on the dashboard. And then the last issue was to agree upon the set of age categories to make sure that we were covering the full spectrum of children and adolescent from that zero to 19 framing. So we, please, uh, back to the other slide, please. The first step involved, um, we did agree um, as part of this to use the scorecard template that all of you are familiar with, with the ALMA initiative, and it would have a traffic light style classification system. We also agreed that we would really center this dashboard on the main domain areas of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, so there are four of them. This includes the survival dimension or be healthy, the area of child protection so that children can be safe and fairly treated, then around development that concerns their education and, and training so that they can um, go on to be our leaders, and then participation so that we ensure that children and adolescents are heard and engaged in communities and their societies. We also are we're well aware of the fact that child health and well-being is affected by the broader environment. So we also had two areas, two additional domain areas to cover contextual factors and policies. And then as you can see, we reached agreement to use the um, standard age categories that have been recommended by WHO for reporting on children and adolescents from that time frame from zero to 19. Next slide, please. So the next part of this process in, involved identifying and selecting the actual indicators. So as we noted previously, um, we had a set of age ranges and then four domains for each, each of the age group things. Um, the process that we used to select the indicators involved taking a look at existing global regional initiatives that cover child health and well-being. So you can see the list here. As has been noted, the origins of this process started with the Lancet Commission. So we went back and took a look at those indicators and then wanted to make sure that these dashboards were relevant to other um, revolutionary kinds of processes underway in the child health community. So looking at the child health redesign that WHO and UNICEF are engaged in, the nurturing care framework, looking at the countdown to 2030 and then other types of initiatives that cover um, child health and well-being. Just to note again, this was a very collaborative and consensus-based process. So we engaged throughout every step with the CAP 2030 data and learning working group. And then we also reached out to technical experts across agencies to make sure that we were picking the best indicator to represent those domain areas. Um, and then just to um, reiterate, when we ultimately chose these indicators, we used a set of, of criteria, including that that indicator had to have some evidence of effectiveness. It needed to have some representation or inclusion in existing global frameworks, and that there would be regular data collection um, from countries. Next slide, please. The last step of putting this dashboard together was setting the thresholds. As, as we noted in the beginning, the stoplight format that you are familiar with on the ALMA scorecard requires assessing levels um, where a country would be considered 
um, in those different categories on the stoplight. So um, accelerating progress is needed and, and those sorts of categories were what we were looking for when we set the threshold. So in order to do this, we started off by making sure that for each indicator, we assessed if there was already an existing global or regional target. Then we also um, discussed with the technical communities, for example, the nutrition and education communities have worked very hard with their country counterparts to establish thresholds and benchmarks for particular indicators. So all of that was incorporated into this uh, decision making. And then we, after we set those categories, we assigned the colors that accord with that stoplight um, framing so that people could then have an easy sense of where countries fall in terms of progress on that particular indicator. And as um, Anthony already noted, we had the privilege of working throughout this whole process with Lushomo, the design company that's based in South Africa, and had a very iterative process in designing these dashboards so that the dashboards were easy to use, highly functional, um, and also had consensus again behind them in terms of, of their use. Next slide, please. So I am now going to hand it over to my colleague, Gerard, who will lead you through a guided tour of the dashboard. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. So I have the pleasure of just introducing the IT data portion of the thing and the dashboard itself and the final result of all the hard work that's come in that can be shown. Um, I want to put special attention to uh, Lois Park, who is one of the data managers that did a lot of the work on this, as well as Jennifer said, a really fantastic team, Lashomo out of Cape Town in South Africa. So they've put together a uh, a lot of the materials that you're looking at uh, and a lot of the, the visualizations on the dashboard. And they also put together a video that we're going to watch that has a step-by-step -step walkthrough of this, uh, of this dashboard. The Child Health and Wellbeing Dashboard has been developed by WHO, UNICEF and CAP 2030 to make the latest data available and accessible to help improve child and adolescent well-being and health. This new tool has been designed to allow anyone working in child and adolescent health to monitor and compare current country data viewed by different regions, income groups, ages, and other categories of interest. This makes it easy to identify at a glance where progress is being made and where gaps still exist. Let's take a quick tour of the dashboard. Country data are divided into age groups each with one indicator shown per domain. The four domains visible on the key are survival, protection, development, and participation. Each data point is color coded for a quick view of progress. The split circles indicate that data are disaggregated, mostly by gender into male and female values, but in some cases by proficiency in reading and math. Full detail on each data point can be seen on hover and clicking on the view numbers button on the control panel reveals the actual values. When launching the dashboard, by default, all countries are displayed alphabetically. This view can be easily rearranged using the control panel on the left. Click once on the regional or income buttons and the data will be rearranged in SDG, WHO or UNICEF regions, or by income group. Clicking a second time reveals a drop-down menu that allows specific regions to be selected and viewed. To sort the data further, use the filter buttons on the control panel below to select, view and compare specific age groups, domains and countries. Contextual and policy-related data are, of course, crucial when considering child health and well-being. This is why these indicators are included by default to the right of the dashboard. On the age and domain filters, they can also be ticked or unticked to change how much data is displayed. To make the dashboard accessible to all, it can also be switched to a colorblind-friendly palette. 
This can be accessed with a colorblind friendly button at the bottom of the control panel. Simply click it again to return to the traffic light palette. Finally, the dashboard allows data to be easily downloaded and used to inform decisions and policy making on child and adolescent health. The green download button at the base of the control panel opens a menu for choosing desired download format. An image download will provide a view of only the current screen. Clicking on PDF or PowerPoint will open a pop-up menu with the option to download the current view or another part of the dashboard. With all these features and functions, the Child Health and Wellbeing Dashboard can serve as a valuable tool for policymakers, decision makers, and anyone working in child and adolescent well being and health. The ultimate goal is to put data to good use and advance the progress of young people's rights, health, and well being worldwide. So that is a video that shows all the, the basic features of the dashboard. Um, of course, we have the dashboard live at this moment. And because this is a collaborative effort, we can see on all of our websites. Um, at the same time, we are all drawing from exactly the same data and from the same dashboard. And the idea is to continue that collaboration going forward so that there's one view of this uh, and, and it's not being maintained in three different places. We're going to put the, these links in the chat in just a few moments so that you can uh, peruse this on your, on your own afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerard. So now what we're going to do is have some reflections on the possible um, uses of this dashboard. And first up is Helga Fostad. She is the executive director of the Partnership for Maternal Newborn and Child um, Health, PMNCH. She is strongly committed to human rights, public health and gender issues. Ms. Fostad has extensive experience in forging partnerships for the health and well-being of women, children, and adolescents. Could you please put her picture up? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, her flight was canceled and now she's in the air and is not able to present. But we have with us the focal point for PMNCH, uh, PMNCH accountability, who will present on her behalf, Elsa Kalima. Please. Do. Thank you very much, uh, Theresa. And indeed, on, on behalf of Helga Foxstead, I'm very delighted to be part of this launch event of the new dashboard on child health and well being that makes the data available in one place easily understandable and comparable, as previous speakers have explained and the importance Antonio highlighted. With these dashboards, we can see the progress or lack of it as it relates to children's survival and health, protection, safety, development, including education, and importantly as well, participation, ensuring they are heard and engaged. On behalf of the PMNCH, the world's largest alliance for women's, children's, and adolescent health and well-being, and our 1,250 organizations working together across 192 countries in 10 constituency groups. And as Antonia highlighted, our board chair being Honorable, right, Honorable Helen Clark, we are most grateful to WHO, UNICEF, and COP2030 for developing this dashboard, which will be very, very helpful for us and our partners in advocacy efforts for better policies, for increased and better financing, and necessary interventions and attention across the sectors. As we know, what gets counted stands better chance of counting in these efforts. And this dashboard will definitely help to keep us hold each other accountable and also deliver on our promises towards children for their rights. As we could see from the, the traffic lights, we still see too many reds and in yellows and a lack of the data, which calls for urgent attention and action 
across, across sectors and partners. And it is even more so as we respond and still recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and prepare for others, and while still also facing increased climate and conflict crisis situations. Children and adolescents must be at the center of our efforts, and they should be actively and meaningfully engaged. Their needs and asks must be heard, prioritized, and responded to. And here we wanted just to share or reiterate or remind some of the key highlights on the current situation. There is still 166 million children under age of five in the world, or one in four, who remain unregistered in birth. We can also see that latest data shows that 43% of the global under five deaths in 2020 uh, occurred in the fragile and conflict settings. And almost half of the children's uh, deaths, the same uh, age range, still are linked to the malnutrition. Also, even before the COVID struck, more than one in seven adolescents aged 10 to 19, which is nicely explained in this uh, dashboard, is estimated with live diagnosed mental disorder and linked to that, 46,000 adolescents died from suicide every year, and that's among the top causes of the death. Meanwhile, when we look at the financing side, wide gaps persist between the mental health needs and the related funding. And some reports find that only 2% of the government health budgets are allocated to mental health spending globally. And now as the COVID-19, as others were saying, is heading into the third year, the impact on the children and young people's well-being continues to weigh us down heavily. And globally, one in seven children have been directly affected by the lockdowns, while more than 1.6 billion children have suffered from the loss of their education. And these school closures have been as much as more than for a full year in some cases. And others, the lack of connectivity and devices have excluded almost one third of the students from pursuing learning remotely the same way, and therefore has increased inequalities in access to quality education, one of the fundamental rights as being said before. The PMNCH is advocating through the COVID-19 call to action campaign, urging the government to prioritize and protect children and adolescents during the pandemic, but also beyond, and also intensify the efforts and calling for more attention to adolescent well-being and fostering the commitments for them across different domains. But in conclusion, the evidence and facts are very clear. And now, with this excellent new dashboard on child rights and well-being as an accountability resource, let us all work together by constantly monitoring the progress, thereby ensuring that each child gets counted and that their needs are made visible for necessary action by us. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for substituting at the last uh, minute. So now we are gonna have uh, what I hope is a very thought provoking uh, panel discussion. And we have three distinguished members of the Children in All Policies 2030 Data and Learning Working Group joining our panel discussion today. Let me introduce them. First is Dr. Tanya Doherty. She's the Chief Specialist Scientist in the Health Systems Research Unit, South Africa Medical Research Council. Her research is focused on health systems requirements for the optimal delivery of priority child health programs at community and primary care. And she has conducted several cluster randomized trials and program evaluations of community and primary services in South Africa and across the continent. She's also an honorary professor in the School of Public Health at University of Western Cape. Second, we have Dr. Kwame Saki. He is a co-founder of the Director 
I am the director for the Center for Learning and Childhood Development, Ghana. Currently, he is the lead consultant supporting UNICEF and Ghana's government to create a monitoring evaluation and learning framework for its early childhood development policy. He is also the program director for Children in All Policies 2030, Ghana. Dr. Saki is a social and behavioral public health scientist with an expertise in maternal, neonatal, and child health in low middle income countries. And finally, Dr. John Barrasso. He is currently the lead advisor, child health in the Department of Global Health at Save the Children in the United States in Washington, DC. Previously, he was the senior health specialist for maternal, newborn and child health at the World Bank, hosted global financing facility for women, children, and adolescents. And prior to that, he had a long career at the U.S. Agency for International Development, where he led environmental health, water supply and sanitation, and maternal and child health programs for over 25 years. Welcome, panel. Can we have the visuals of the panel? Their actual videos? Can you open them? So the first question I want to present to the panel, and I'm actually, this is a question for um, Tanya. As we have seen from the presentation so far, we designed a, a dashboard based on specific domains. And when in each domain, we divide it by specific age groups. We choose a proxy indicator to represent each domain within each age group. Even accounting for the need to use proxies so as to not overwhelm the dashboard with data points, we may still have some significant, significant gaps in data in some areas. Tanya, can you please tell us where you think we have data gaps and how we might address them? Thanks, Teresa. So I think in, in terms of availability of data and quality of data, there are a couple of observations that we can make from this dashboard. Um, firstly, if we look at the domains across all six age groupings, we are fortunate to have complete coverage of data for the survival indicators. And this is because this data comes from the UN IGMI analysis, and it's been part of regular reporting for many years. Unfortunately, for the remainder of the domains, many of the indicators rely on national household surveys, and some of them were newly introduced for SDG reporting. And so we do see some gaps in uh, availability of data, um, particularly around the development indicators across all age groups, as well as with the participation indicators, with the exception of school completion uh, for the oldest two age groups. And then if we look at the protection domain, um, from the one to four year age group and older, we have some data gaps the indicators in this domain, especially for um, positive discipline and child labor. But not only are there uh, some gaps that we see for countries reporting on indicators, we see that there's actually currently only one country in the world, and that is Serbia, that is not classified as red for the positive discipline indicator across both the one to four year and the five to nine year age groups. And the red classification means that urgent attention is required. And it really means that half of children um, surveyed um, for, for this data, um, or the parents that were surveyed, have, have experienced um, nonviolent discipline in the previous month. So um, this is really a, a, an indication that uh, a lot of attention is required, particularly on this, um, on this indicator. Another indicator, if we look at intimate partner violence um, amongst 15 to 19 year olds, at the other end of the spectrum, every country in the world reporting on this indicator is classified as green or making good progress, which means that less than 1% of young women are experiencing intimate partner violence. Um, so I think having a dashboard, bringing all of this information together for all countries in the world it not only helps us to identify certain gaps, but also to think about some data quality issues. And so we should be really scrutinizing uh, whether these indicators actually represent the true experience of children and adolescents. Is there really not a country in the world 
that's reporting on intimate partner violence that has more than 1% intimate partner violence amongst young women. So um, a dashboard like this really, it needs to be flexible. We need to think about adding and dropping indicators if we determine that perhaps the, the quality is poor or if a particular indicator is not adequately measuring the aspect of child well-being that it's supposed to represent. So the, the gaps in the data um, in the dashboard are either because the data hasn't been collected or because the data is more than uh, five years old. And, and even with the current data in this dashboard, we do have some indicators from as old as, as 2016. So we need to recognize that this largely represents the pre-COVID situation in the world because there have been very few national household surveys undertaken in the past two years. And we do know that um, children have been greatly impacted by indirect effects of, of COVID-19. Another consideration in terms of data availability um, is that the dashboard provides national estimates with disaggregation, as we've heard, by sex for a few indicators. And if we look at uh, the situation of children at, at a national level, we're not really able to understand some of the realities and inequities by region or by rural and urban area, which we know can be vastly different. So what this dashboard shows us is that we need far greater investments to strengthen systems for the collection and use of routine and administratively connected data so that we're not so reliant on these externally managed national household surveys. And we need to engage with countries to explore what opportunities there may be locally to fill some of these data gaps and to generate locally meaningful data. And this will encourage participation and co-ownership, and of course, also increase the potential for local accountability. Thank you so much, Tanya, for pointing all of those out. And I just want to make a point to the um, to the audience that if you go to the dashboard and you choose a country of interest uh, or your country, you can see where there's missing data as you hover over the different uh, circles. So I encourage you to go and look at that. So um, my second question is for John. We hope this dashboard can be used at global, regional, and country levels. And John, I know you strongly support the use of data beyond advocacy, but also for program implementation and resource allocation. What do you think might be the utility of this dashboard at the global and regional level? John? Thanks, Teresa. And uh, I wanna say that both as a former commissioner, as someone whose career has spanned many different dimensions and sectors to actually focus on children, it's really great that we've got this dashboard and it's been brought to fruition in the wake of the uh, Lancet Commission report. You know, it's, uh, the Commission report came out in February 2020. It was, you know, the, in terms of timing, we've been able to sustain some effort, uh, even despite the COVID pandemic, to really keep this sort of bigger picture, of, uh, this bigger picture on what needs to happen to improve outcomes, well-being, rights, and health, ultimately, as well for children. Um, so thankful to CAP 2030 for organizing us so well, and for UNICEF and WHO for carrying forward all the work, the real nuts and bolts work of moving this dashboard forward. And I think all of us who are members of that CAP 2030 data and learning working group to provide that inputs over the course of that year, really gratified to see it you know, come to fruition. It's also interesting to note that we have almost 200 participants in this webinar today, and they go well beyond the usual suspects, which I think is a good sign that this is the kind of dashboard that could potentially have broad application. I'll talk a little bit about the way it could be used at global and regional levels, and I think we'll talk more about how it could be used at country level. And as you said, you know, advocacy is not an end in itself, and measurement is actually also not an end in itself. As Jennifer said, we're trying to use this to drive action. And you know, at the global and regional levels, two key components of taking action are really being doing a better job at priority setting and ensuring some kind of accountability. Uh, over, you know, over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity now to work in three large organizations and there are three very different types of organizations. One is a national donor, 
This is when I was at USAID. The other is a multilateral organization. This was the GFF within the World Bank. And now from an NGO, implementing NGO, uh, but large, very large one, Save the Children. And you know, looking, having had that opportunity and to look at the problem, the fundamental problem we're trying to help support, which is improving the rights and well-being of all children everywhere. And having had the opportunity to look at it from technical, programmatic, and policy dimensions, the problem of deciding what to do and what to invest in is ubiquitous. It's and it's, you know, we always talk about, well, how do we actually try to set priorities in low resource settings? But it's not really just low resource settings. It's a it, priority setting is difficult across all countries everywhere. And there are reasons fundamentally why priority setting is difficult, but it's also incredibly important. So the degree to which we can gather information, gather data into a dashboard that helps create information that actually can be used to help set priorities and really drive that conversation is really a very important and a very valuable contribution. I do think that as me measurement and our ability to use existing data to come up with better estimates of high level indicators like child mortality, uh, that's we've made a lot of both, um, both, method, both progress and methodology and also progress in seeing that these are actually used and accepted. But even as these estimates of, for example, something that I personally focus on a lot, which is under five mortality, have become more accurate and precise, the complexity to, complexity to ensure not only survival, but good health and well-being across all of childhood has grown more complex in so many ways. And it's this dashboard really does, I think, try to capture that, but also make it not just capture it in terms of problem statement, but actually capture it in a way that can help drive action and solutions. Examples are climate change, uh, endemic conflict. These are not necessarily new, but we're sort of capturing them in new ways. And they imply that we need to focus on the rights of children that are most impacted by these inequalities. Even, even survival until age five, if you look at it from a global and regional level, it's increasingly concentrated in fewer countries and it's within countries amongst the most marginalized populations, typically. We at Save the, at Save the Children, the 22 to 2024 global strategy really is uh, embracing this complexity, both in problem definition and in response. At Save, I personally focus on giving children a healthy start in life. That includes the essential health services for survival, good nutrition, nurturing care, but then also extending into other strategic dimensions beyond health, ensuring a clean environment, ensuring protection from, from violence. So this dashboard it would help save and it would help others like save to, to help sort out this complexity across the life course of childhood. And I do think that the four domains that came out of the Lancet Commission report, the Lancet WHO UNICEF Commission report, or, yep, of survival, protection, development, and participation are spot on along with this, along with the contextual factors. And we, you know, we had long discussions about how best to incorporate the contextual factors. And I do think that we've um, hopefully got it in a way that makes it accessible and makes it useful information across countries. This excellent alignment with the strategic priorities of many organizations. Uh, and I, that includes Save the Children, and I assume that's the case in full or at least in part for other child-focused organizations at the global and regional levels. One way in which we can use this dashboard is to, you know, it's because of its flexibility, and I really want to, you know, the, the flexibility was demonstrated in the video, and it's really useful to play with that and use the dashboard actively. You can use to identify groups of countries that have some similar characteristics, either doing that globally or within certain sub-regions of interest, or if there are countries that are already prioritized for engagement by organizations to help set programmatic priorities across countries and within those countries. So this is one of the ways I hope that this could be used most effectively, since that no organization can do everything, it's how do we actually use this to drive better coordinated action for children across multiple partners. And then amongst those partners also to hold, have accountability 
for when we don't see the required investments emerging and coordination happening. You know, and it's important to remember that in this sphere of child health and child protection and child rights and child well-being, it's not all driven by global investments. It's also really largely driven by country level investments and figuring out the ways that those, all the global, regional and country investments can be best coordinated. There are gonna be few uh, uh, priorities that are applicable in every country. And as I said, no single organization is gonna have the capacity to address all of these priorities. So hopefully this is the way, one way that we can help organize collective action and accountability. And it makes, and it will ultimately, as I said at the start, make the best possible use of what are ultimately limited resources to secure the rights and well-being of all children. Of course, um, the rubber meets the road, as they say, at the country level with the challenge of translating priorities and indicators into, program, into programs. Tanya has highlighted the need for better use of routine data. We're gonna talk more about how do we translate what are truly indicators of, in, of issues into programs that address these issues comprehensively. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about that country level use. So um, I'm gonna pass, pass it back to you, Teresa. And again, thanks for the opportunity to make a few reflections. Thank you, John, for those reflections. So now I'll turn my next question over to Kwame. Now that we heard how we might be able to use it at the global and regional level, it would be good to discuss how this might be used at a country level. Kwame, can you describe how this dashboard might be used as a country level? Perhaps you can provide an example from Ghana. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this process. And I think to understand where I'm coming from, I'm both an, I'm an academic and also from Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, and also uh, lead a nonprofit in Ghana where we are constantly engaging with policymakers and stakeholders to address some of the issues that are facing children in Ghana. Uh, we are a research organization, so oftentimes we are looking at data and trying to help uh, ministries and departments and agencies think through different data for it. Um, so the first one is comes from uh, a conversation I had had with a program uh, manager uh, within one of our ministries, and we've been working in the area of early childhood development uh, care and programs. And it's like at the end of the year, I need to write a report, and in that report, I need data to be able to show how well we are doing. But the challenge is that, particularly if you're working in early childhood development you know, and working around the nurturing care framework, it has so much data to choose from. So which one do I end up putting in a report to communicate uh, how well we are doing? And I think a dashboard like this, looking at the different age groups and the different age bands allows at the country level, even for program managers to know what the global conversation is, to know what indicators are important at the country level, but also what also matters uh, um, at, at a global stage. The second one that we have seen the dashboard help us is within the context of monitoring evaluation for policy around early childhood development. So uh, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, UNICEF Ghana and Claire Outcomes uh, and I are working to help Ghana revise its early childhood development policy. And here again, if you look at the nurturing care framework with all its different domains, there are so many indicators to choose from. So what the dashboard has been able to help us is to look at each of the different domains and say, which ones are critical, which core indicators are critical. So we've been able to use the dashboard to help us narrow down the indicators that we are looking at and also provide us some opportunity to compare Ghana to other places and I think, this will also be very useful for different countries as they begin to think about different policies uh, for children and trying to improve their well-being. The last one has been the areas of advocacy. So some of the work that come from Oakland University and our friends have been doing are also around uh, children with disabilities. So you see in the dashboard we have you know children who are uh, meeting a developmental milestone, but I think it also opens up in a conversation from an advocacy standpoint is where does disability fit within this global context of data and how do we show uh, disability related work across the different domains uh, within the, the child's rights framework. And then the last one is that within the children all policies, 
I think we have been stressing the fact that children need to be involved in the decision making, children need to, voices need to be heard. And I think what this dashboard can be used within the country contest, and what I love about it is the color coding systems of it so that it is really accessible for young people, particularly adolescents and, and who can even look at this data to be able to hold their country level uh, policy makers also accountable. So I see this also as a way that youth-based advocacy groups can leverage on the data that is available to push uh, the agenda forward to help children's voices to be heard. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those perspectives. Now, I have like maybe a little controversial question to throw out to the entire panel. And that is we put almost all the countries in the world into one dashboard. However, country context and level of development can be very different. So how might this impact the comparability of countries and what else might we want to consider? Perhaps, John, you can start us off. Uh, sure, uh, sure, I can try. So, you know, I do think, uh, just to reiterate something I em and emphasize something I said earlier, I mean, I first, I agree fully that context matters. Um, and what we, I mean, one of the things that the dashboard is designed to do is to allow that, that breakout by, for example, regions or income groups, and to be able to do that, that flexibility will allow the comparability to see, okay, yes, here I am, I'm, but I'm not, in my country, I don't necessarily want to compare myself to European countries or the United States. I wanna see where I stand on these issues vis-a-vis -vis other comparable countries. So I do think that that flexibility that we have in the dashboard is actually going to be quite important in terms of being able to help countries understand at that national level, you know, where do they in fact, where do they in fact sit vis-a-vis -vis their peers? So I'll, I'll pass it on to the others now. Well, thank you very much. So Kwame, any additional thoughts on, on this? Yeah, I think one of the things I've been advocating part is uh, to help program managers really think about how do they even compare themselves to other countries, you know, like am I from Mali or Senegal or Ghana, like who do I really compare myself to and even why? So one of the things that I think would be really helpful to go along with the dashboard, particularly thinking about program managers and policymakers is even a simple write up or a piece that allows and help them understand the indexes and, and the data, but also how do they really compare themselves to countries that might be similar to them in one way or the other? The other one is also is that sometimes dashboards has a way of, you know, some countries always do well, some countries always doesn't do it. And sometimes if you're a country that you're not always doing, there's a little bit of a stigma-ish attached to it, you know? And so um, it is important to also show progress over time, you know, so that if countries are doing well, even if they compare themselves to other countries and are not necessarily meeting the goals, but like at least they are showing progress over time, uh, it will be, be quite, quite important. So I think that'll be something I would like to uh, share. So Tanya, do you have anything else to add to this question we just asked? Thanks, Teresa. So yeah, absolutely. There, there are certainly trade-offs between having standardized indicators applied across all countries in the world it provides us with comparability um, and then on the other hand having the flexibility to choose indicators that might be most relevant to individual countries so for example should we be choosing indicators that are aligned with the major causes of death and disability of children in a particular country um, but what is most striking when you look at this dashboard is that there are quite a number of indicators for example, which no high income countries report on at all. So we have all countries in the world in this dashboard, but uh, for the high income countries, there's not a single high income country that um, reports on um, many indicators in the protection domain, uh, positive discipline, child labor, um, no high income countries report on postnatal care for newborns or care seeking for fever. Um, and there's less than five that report on early, early breastfeeding, EBF, maths proficiency, and, and reading proficiency. So, I mean, 
these are possibly because these countries have already met the targets or because they don't deem the indicators to be relevant to their situation. So perhaps we need to be asking ourselves, um, should we be having a dashboard that includes all countries in the world um, when certain groups of countries don't report at all on some of the indicators? Um, or should we consider investing time and resources into having a more flexible dashboard for countries that are possibly more likely to use it and benefit from it? And that really um, goes back to the question of who are the intended beneficiaries of the dashboard? And that's something um, to, to consider um, going forward. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. This is very um, thought-provoking panel, and I really appreciate your uh, participation. And I think we're doing really good on time, so we're going to go over to our next um, section. And I just want to thank all three of you for um, your thoughts and reflections on the dashboard. So um, we've explained how we made the dashboard. We showed you how it works and reflected on its potential use. So now we want your input. We want to give you a chance to make uh, recommendations and to ask us to change things and to test things and so forth. So our next speaker is going to be discussing our testing plans. Sevastin Rajagopalan is a recent graduate from um, the MC. MC SC Global Health Development Program for the University College of London. And currently he is supporting the data and learning working group of CAP 2030 by supporting the ongoing research and developments in child health. So I turn it over to you to tell the um, audience how we hope to be able to test this dashboard. Thank you, Ther Teresa. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Srivatsan Rajagopalan and I support the Data and Learning Working Group at CAP 2030. Um, can I please get the next slide? I will be presenting on the test, testing strategies for the dashboard. Um, could I please get the next slide? Key policy and decision makers are faced with huge collections of data and numerous tools to help guide them. A useful tool to centralize and visualize this data are dashboards. Therefore, it is critical for them to be easy to use and the information semantics to be understood by the users. Through an effective testing strategy, it will allow us to increase user adoption, provide understanding of the user experience, and helps us improve and refine the dashboard through the aggregation of feedback, thus improving the effectiveness of the dashboard as a tool for accountability and advocacy for children's health and well being. There is an opportunity for all of you to get involved in this process. We welcome and invite you all to provide feedback on your ex experience and impressions that can help shape the development of the dashboard. Can I please get the next slide? We chose to adapt a layered approach for the testing of the dashboard. Layer zero. This is where all the pre-launch checks were carried out. As Jennifer touched upon this process, within the CAP 2030 Data and Learning Working Group and with colleagues from WHO and UNICEF, we used internal feedback channels and discussions to refine the dashboard prior to the launch. We reviewed aspects such as design, indicator selection, and dashboard features. For instance, we carried out some initial integration tests during the embedding process to see if the dashboard user interface would fit the respective websites and worked as intended. Layers one and two will happen over nine months. Layer one is functional testing. This level ensures that the core functionality of the dashboard is operational and will look at aspects such as data validation, making sure that the data is displayed correctly, the filters are operational, and the data is accessible and downloadable. Other aspects include things like navigation and user script testing. This will allow us to understand if users can follow scripts and work the dashboard to reach desired outputs without issues. Layer two looks at utility. This level will look at if the dashboard is fit for purpose. Is the dashboard useful for key decision makers as a tool for advocacy and accountability? At this level, we will look at aspects such as who is using the dashboard. 
are key decision makers accessing the dashboard? Also, how is the dashboard being used? Are the users using the dashboard to collect or download the data as it centralizes useful child health indicators? Or are policymakers utilizing the traffic light system to determine priority areas and as a guide, guidance on areas for improvement? This would provide insights into the potential utility of the dashboard, which can help shape the development based on the uses seen. We are also looking into some pilot work in specific countries to gain more in-depth feedback. However, this is still under discussion and something that may require further resources. Next slide, please. As outlined, the plan is to collect this feedback over the nine months by using three avenues for comments. Firstly, a questionnaire or survey will be developed as a form of collecting specific data on user experience and their thoughts on the usefulness of the tool. These will be embedded in the respective websites. The second avenue is website data analytics. The dashboard is being integrated into three websites. This will provide opportunity to generate reports from the website usage. Tools like Google Analytics will provide insights into user behavior. For instance, what pages are the users looking at? How long are they spending on average on the dashboard? Are these users returning to the user dashboard? Other information on user traffic, who and where are users utilizing the dashboard from? Are there any particular regions that are using the dashboard more than others? and insights into the age and gender of these users. Lastly, it'll look at user acquisition. This will provide insight into how users are finding the dashboard. Are they finding it through search engines, through papers, or are they finding it through social media? Lastly, we will use a website contact form. This will be placed on the respective sites to offer alternative free form feedback by users. Next slide, please. Through the aggregation of feedback over the nine months, it will provide us with useful data. These insights will help shape the phase two of the dashboard development and can provide vital information to make the dashboard a better tool for advocacy, accountability, and policy generation. The WHO and UNICEF are working collaboratively to develop a system for regular data updates through an automated method that will ensure that the data is kept up to date. We hope to keep to have the next iteration of the dashboard in 12 to 14 months. Thank you for listening. Thank you, and this is very exciting and we really do wanna get some um, feedback. But we already have some feedback right now from Q's and A's. And um, we're going to go through some of the questions that have come up during the course of this webinar. So I want to ask my colleague, Kate Strong, if there's any interesting questions we should address and to whom among our distinguished presenters may be best to answer those questions. Kate? Yes, thanks very much, Teresa. We have a lots and lots of questions in the Q&A, which is really, it's great to see the interest. And I think we start with some, there's just a subset, I think some have been answered online already. But there's a subset that I think are valuable to express uh, out loud. And um, there are three of them that start just with the dashboard. And I think, Gerard, you might be best placed to answer these questions. Um, the first is, uh, how often will the dashboard be updated? I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer that, but I do believe <laughs> the idea is to do it uh, annually at this point. And I think uh, Jennifer and Teresa might actually be able to speak a little bit more to that, but that's the idea. Okay, um, just to say that at some point, if we can improve the functionality, we could do more frequent updates and automatically have the updates come to the dashboard. But right now we don't have that, uh, but we will attempt to put that in in the future. So I think here's an interesting one also um, directed at the dashboard. And I think Jennifer, you answered this online and I wonder if you could um, maybe say this uh, out loud. So who will manage the dashboard? Thank you, Kate. Yes, I did, I did answer. Um, I just wanna stress that this dashboard has been developed and is a collective effort between WHO, UNICEF and CAP 2030. So the intention is that, that WHO and UNICEF will jointly be um, 
managing the global database aspects of it and working very closely in a collaborative fashion to um, maintain it over time. So, so that is the intent um, given how important it is that this has been done through a collective and coordinated and consensus-based process. Thanks. Great. All right, so now if we move uh, beyond the dashboard into looking at how to strengthen national data collections, there's a tricky question. I wonder if John and or Kwame want to um, weigh in on this one. How will the WHO and UNICEF develop dash the, the, the dashboard that's been developed help to strengthen national platforms? Uh, I can take one one shot at it. I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can take one one, one shot at it. I, th I think uh, when the dashboard was and uh, you know I reached out to Teresa and Jennifer and Srivastans that it, it is really important to show the dashboard to uh, policymakers in the context where a lot of them are meeting. So, for example, COP twenty thirty in Ghana is having their policy dissemination in in June, and so one of the things that we really want to do is to show the dashboard to policymakers so that they can see where the gaps are and then collectively uh, think about how do we uh, strengthen the data collection pieces uh, to be able to kind of address that gap. So dissemination, I think, is really, really key. Okay. Anybody want to add, John? Well, I guess the only thing I would add to that, Kate, is that the issue of strengthening routine data systems is, you know, one that's ubiquitous. And I do think that as we try both what is going on in terms of the narrow issue that I focus most of my time on, which is maternal and child health, but also now that we're looking at this broader set of, of indicators, how do some of the routine systems potentially feed into this? Now, in the health sector, we do have this advantage that over the last now probably more than a decade, the DHIS2 systems at country level have had the benefit of systems investment from coming from, you know, to some extent, not necessarily systems driven investment, but investments from PEPFAR, investments under uh, investments from the Global Fund. And how do we better leverage those platforms to try to ensure that if data is being collected around any of these issues at some lower level within countries that it's actually ultimately captured in these routine reporting systems so we can generate information from it. Um, I don't think that we're there yet. I think that's frankly, I think there's a, you know, a number of these parameters for which uh, we're not, we don't necessarily have information collected at that very local facility, whether it's a school facility or a health facility. But I do think we can continue to advocate for inclusion of some of this and actually use that platform that already exists to try to better gather this information and bubble it up um, you know, to this dashboard, but also particularly to national decision-making, over. All right, thank you very much. So now if we, um, Kwame, do you want to add or we go on to the next question? Okay, we'll go on to the next question and it's about the dashboard and the rights of the child. And the question is, is the dashboard or any of the indicators linked to recommendations from the general comment number 15 in 2013 on the right of the child to enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health? So, so how are these linked? I think that there was a brief answer from this um, online from Jennifer, but I wonder if Teresa, you want to answer some of this as well. And then well, maybe Jennifer can add. Actually, I would say if, also, if Anthony was uh, is, yeah. is online, so either Jennifer or Anthony, if you would like to try to answer this question. I would like to try, but I'm not sure I can answer it, actually. Um, uh, it, it, it's about the general comment. Perhaps you could clarify. Jennifer, you, you start because you know about the general comments. So the response I gave was um, more general about the fact that the dashboards are meant to cover the four domains in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, one of which is a pillar around right to health. So um, it is captured in the dashboard. I did want to flag that as we've been talking, the, the dashboard has 
one indicator per domain area. So for the health area, we focused on survival, um, recognizing that that's sort of the, the impact level, the, the kind of bottom line indicator for health. Um, but in that sense, we that is how we've tried to ensure that this dashboard does reflect on the rights of the child to health. Um, Anthony, back to you. you want to add <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's just that we need um, countries to take action. I mean, this is going to be a work in progress. And, and what we want from this dashboard is to stimulate a response. And in our contextual columns, which will accumulate new indicators over time, particularly relating to policy development and action taken by governments, it will be a chance to look and see you know, are the cabinets of countries really taking this seriously? Are they really making a concerted effort to deal with it? And policy, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you shouldn't rank countries. But, you know, I remember Helen Clark saying to us that, the first, you know, if she ever saw a ranking table it, when she was prime minister of New Zealand, the first thing she would look at is to see what was happening in Australia, <laughs> you know, next door. And we, you do compare, and it does introduce an element of co competition for people. And that's going to be good because it's going to make sure that people really focus on some of these important issues uh, around children's rights to health, protection, education, and the like. We have, um, we have, we have three questions that are basically about the same thing. So I'm gonna sort of combine them into one question. And they're talking about following the launch of the dashboard, which we've just doing today. What are the key next steps for countries? Along with that is the question, um, will the dashboard be flexible in any way so that new indicators can be added if necessary? So that sort of goes into the next steps part. And then there's a final question, which countries are chosen for piloting? which is also wraps into next steps for countries. So I wonder if we can throw these questions back to the panel, but also to Jennifer and Teresa for comments. Thank you. Well, I, I can start um, very um, briefly. The last presentation you saw told you about the testing. So that is the, um, the, the feedback that we want to get. We're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible but still within constraints, we don't want to be constantly changing the dashboard. So that we're doing kind of a nine month period where we want feedback, we want testing, we want suggestions for other um, indicators. And then we will try to do that in the dashboard, keeping in mind that an indicator that's suggested has to have some data. It can't be like, oh, I think this would be great. And there's zero information about it. So just to keep that in mind. As far as pilot testing right now, we would like countries to come to us and say, we want volunteer, we want to be able to pilot test this. We're trying to find the resources so that we can support such a pilot testing. But right now, what we would like is, is if anyone on the line or any country on the line to come back to us and say, yes, my country's interested, my country wants to go through this. I don't know if anyone else wants to um, add to this. Can I just add one thing about resources? I mean, we are looking for resources at the moment to look at ways in which we could pilot it. But, you know, WHO and UNICEF, this is about the future of our children. I can't think of anything more important than that. And WHO and UNICEF, I'm sad to say, and I can say this because I'm independent of them, are absurdly underfunded. And if there are countries out there, wealthy countries, who've got money to spend, spare or would be prepared to do it do invest in you know go to who go to unicef say this is something we really like to support or indeed benefactors high net worth individuals because this is the kind of work that is going to bring about long-term sustainable change because countries are going to take ownership of the most important thing in the world, which is to leave the world a better place for our children, rather than a worse place, which is the way we're going at the moment. So Kate, I wanna thank you for bringing those questions to us. I wanna thank the audience for those questions and the panelists and presenters for answers. And I wanna move on to our next um, presenter. Um, we had a really exciting meeting today. And I would like to introduce you to Vidya Ganesh, who will provide some last 
Reflections. Vidya Ganesh is the Director of the Division of Data and Analytics Planning and Monitoring for UNICEF Headquarters, New York. And prior to her current position, she served as UNICEF Deputy Director, Program Division, and that was since January 2016. Vidya, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Teresa. So nice to be with you again. And, uh, and, uh, and, and thank you for, um, um, for this fascinating dialogue that we've just had. So let me just, of course, you know, wish everybody a very good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever uh, you are. And it's, um, it's, it was, it's, it's such a pleasure. And then I also felt uh, very moved and encouraged by both the concept of uh, and the thought behind the dashboard and also the enthusiasm that, uh, that the participants uh, exhibited in terms of the value that it would add to really advancing the rights of the children and specifically the, the four around which the, the, the dashboard uh, has, has been developed. And, and, and really thanks also to, um, to Dr. Costello and, and Dr. John Barrazzo, our old colleagues and friends, uh, you know, uh, who have been very, very passionate about, you know, really uh, being very clear about why this is an imperative. This is not something that's nice to have, but it's a must, it's, it's, it's something a dashboard of this kind, which um, which which brings, um, you know, often we have struggled. How do you look at a child outcomes from a multi-sectoral perspective and using the rights framing, which then emphasizes the focus on the inequities and the drivers of the inequities, and then helps bring the relevant data and and and, and a very very careful sifting uh, that has been done, kind of almost giving us the best possible calibrated combination. Of, of if these indicators all move in some amount of tandem in the right direction, you're gonna get that leverage because we're talking about bending the curve and bending the curve fast and bending the curve in, in those parts of the world where the countries and the children are, are being most left behind. So both, so it's really congratulations to, to all of the developers and, and, and also, you know, this has been, uh, uh, supported through, uh, as, as uh, Anshu mentioned, it's been a careful thought process from the launch of the um, Lancet Commission, and which has obviously been, very, you know, led by global luminaries. So, so I, I, we really are in a very good position to finally kind of move, uh, move, uh, and work, uh, and move the work at the country level for for policy decision making that's based on on on. Um, on, on the data, and if the data processes improve, it can become more real time. So somebody asked, how frequently will it be updated? Obviously, the, there has been a lot of comments around. Um, you know, it it all depends. It and it depends on the on the investments in the routine systems. It all depends on 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 how the uh, the use for this. And and I think it was a colleague from Ghana who mentioned the more you disseminate. To the to the decision makers, the more likely you're going to have the uptake uh, of the of the of, of the tool, because from from what I noticed, you know, there are as many greens and oranges there are. There are also equally reds, which indicate you know uh, some some important um, data gaps. And um, and, um, and and Tanya did an excellent uh, 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 you know presentation of. Of, of where those data gaps are and, and how important they are to fill. So all in all, really very exciting um, uh, to, uh, to have such a dashboard that, that, that serves both as uh, evidence for decision-making and, and through that process, it gives a, uh, you know, a comparable mechanism to, uh, for, uh, to, to uh, hold ourselves accountable as, 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 a, as, a, as a collective but also know how, how each of us can play a role in, in uh, towards moving towards our common, common good. And, um, and, and I just also wanted to add maybe three reflections, which, which, uh, which I think um, I already did uh, talk about. It's, it's really moving from having data that brings the many perspective to how that I hope and then stimulates uh, policy and, and program delivery in that multi-sectoral fashion at the, uh, you know, at the national and subnational level. And I also hope that, that when 
when, when the policymakers and program managers are looking at these dashboards, while it may be probably at the moment being aggregated at the national level, it drives it, it drives high quality discussions and dialogue. How then this you know can help drive the probe uh, at the, at the sub national and the district level where you know a, a lot of the the kind of the decision making also happens in terms of delivery and 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 and, and quality of the of the services and where the multi sectorality really comes alive. So so really bringing those two elements together. I also hope that the, that the cross country comparability also promotes and stimulates country learning and policy exchange across countries. Uh, I, I think it was, um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was John who was mentioning that, you know, I, I, I want to know, uh, I want to know how my compare, you know, how countries with similar contexts uh, actually affair, because a, a lot of time when we look at across the countries and you say well that country is different from mine so i you know i really don't know if if, if it's worth bothering but i think having um having um a framework of rights which 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 is something that is enshrined in 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 most countries national development plans policies and and, and laws and that uh, national laws and policies I, I think it gives uh gives a kind of a unique way by which you can bring some uh, comparable contextual factors as well, because at the end of the day, what we want is to make sure that the rights of the children uh, uh, that are impacted by inequalities uh, can, can be addressed systematically and, and over time. And, 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 and the third reflection I just really wanted to add is all of this is only useful when countries contribute the data. So we have to really create a, a, a use of this dashboard which makes people comfortable and data is inherently can can be sensitive. So how do you move, how do you kind of reduce the sting on that side and actually make it like this is about uh, getting the best program results and it's about making the best choices in, in policy. So so really, I think that the, the value of it and the use of it is enormous. Um, <clears throat> I, I did hear some <laughs> some uh, some uh, uh, worry and constraints about how this can be further uh, be piloted and used. Uh, I, I think there has to be a very, very strong collective push moving forwards uh, in terms of the uh, resources. I think it's not only about maintaining the, the global database and improving the utility of it and improving the features of, of uh, and making it much more human centric and user friendly and increasing user experience. It's also fundamentally about how the collective is also supporting the, the national governments and the district level uh, managers to, to address some of the systemic issues. I think there was some reference made about, you know, how resources that have come largely from vertical programs contributing narrowly to system strengthening, actually there is more investment and that investment is not huge usually, but there isn't enough uh, emphasis on it. And, and I really hope that the national governments can uh, can see the value of investing in systems uh, and health systems and data systems, uh, you know, at, at, at all levels. So all in all, really um, a big congratulations and, and my sincere gratitude and, th and, and thanks to a huge number of people who have worked on this. And and uh, and on also all the very best to all of those who will be using it and making lives better for children uh, uh, all over all, all over the world. This dashboard is being launched uh, uh, at a pivotal historical moment, uh, unfortunately, where children's rights are under threat. So we do want to work today to leave a better future for children tomorrow. We don't want our grandchildren pointing fingers at us, do we? Uh, and, and I'm at that stage where I could be a grandmother and I, it, it keeps me keeps me awake uh, all the time. So, you know, as we recover from COVID, uh, you know, and, and as we find better ways to uh, adapt to the climate change and mitigate some of these drought factors or or unfortunately deal with the complexities that are arising out of conflicts and, and, and we are seeing the war in Ukraine unfold in, in, in front of us with, with a lot of worry and, and horror. So, so although these are existential threats, looming possibilities of economic resistance in many countries, 
seem daunting, we should remain optimistic. And there is room for optimis optimism. As we can see today, the global community is coming together to better leverage resources to support the country. So it's really, it's in the collective where, where we're gonna see the big difference and, uh, and, and, and the trust in the systems, which will really help us leverage the best investments and, 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 and as a collective, if we are committed to providing a supportive environments so that all our children can, can, can thrive and, and, and realize their rights. Um, so thank you all again for participating in today's webinar and thank you to, to the organizers uh, of this webinar. But my sincere thanks and congratulations to the, to the partnerships and also all of the people who have contributed over the last many years to reach this very pivotal point. But once you reach this point, you know, you, you always then look very quickly want to pivot to the next step. So, uh, so I hope that the momentum remains and we have a very strong pathway to move forward. So all the best to everyone. Thank you so much. So thank you. And with this, this ends the webinar. I just want to let everybody know that we will share the pre uh, presentation with participants. Um, uh, please go to the links and use the um, dashboard. And hopefully a year from now, we will have a revised dashboard that's even better with more up-to-date data and extensively used. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.